Hello fellow adventure queens, my name is Katie Pinya and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about Adventure Kit. Uh, before I start, I'll tell you a little bit about me. Um, I've been adventuring for nearly 15 years now. My first uh, adventure was a four and a half thousand kilometre hike along the Great Wall of China, uh, full length from the westernmost terminus to the easternmost terminus, and I was the first person in the world to do this. I started in the Gobi Desert in plus 40 degree heat and then spent months in minus 35 walking across the mountains. I battled sandstorms and snowstorms. I went days without food. I actually lost an inch in height from compression of the spine from the weight of my pack. So yeah, it was very eventful, but an amazing journey. And by the end of it, I'd opened this Pandora's box of adventure and have been addicted ever since. I've since gone on to ski across the third largest ice cap in the world, the Southern Patagonian Ice Cap. Um, it's the longest ever crossing by a woman. I've also solo traversed Iceland. I have um, cycled down Africa on a bike that I bought for a few dollars in the Sahara Desert. It had no, uh, no gears, no brakes, so that was very eventful. Um, I've also cycled the original 1911 Tour de France. It was five and a half thousand kilometers, and I did that in the same time that the pros take to do the current tour, which is 2,000 kilometers shorter. And um, yeah, I've lived in the Arctic Ocean in minus 50 for months on end, so very varied, done lots of things, very exciting things. But I'm most definitely not an expert at anything, far more a jack of all trades and master of none. But in 15 years, obviously, I've learned lots and uh, learned lots of things I had no idea about when I started out. So I'm going to share a few of those things now in the hope that if you're new to kind of big multi-week multi adventures, uh, particularly to remote places, that it might be of use to you. Obviously, kit is a massive subject. I could talk to you about it for hours. Um, and it's really dependent on where in the world you're going and by what mode of travel to kind of the exact kit you need. But for the sake of this right now, I'm going to base it on the fact that you're going somewhere um, self-sufficient, so carrying everything you need with you, rather than staying in kind of accommodation or campsites. Okay, so if you are heading off on a big adventure, a big expedition for multiple weeks, and maybe you're going to the other side of the world, you spent time, money and effort preparing for this big trip, then you want to give yourself the best chance of succeeding when you get there. And the best way of doing that is looking after your body, looking after your joints. And we do that by trying to keep our kit weight down to as light a weight as possible. Now I know uh, lightweight kit tends to be the most expensive and I'm not saying you have to have the most expensive things to go on these big trips. You just really need to think about what you're packing to keep that weight as low as possible. And general, generally that means you don't need half the amount of things that you think you do. You might want them, but you don't need them. To give you an idea of pack weights, an ideal pack weight is you say you're doing a through hike, your backpack would want to be under 10 kilos uh, without your consumables. So no food, no fuel, no uh, water. Yeah, if it can be between six to 10 kilos, that's amazing. Obviously, if you're staying in accommodation, it might be as low as five kilos. And if you're going to kind of the polar regions or in the winter, it will obviously be more than 10 kilos, but that's a really good place to try and aim for. To give you an example of why it needs to be that light, walking across Iceland last summer, which took me two weeks, I then had to obviously carry all my food and all my fuel. And that took my pack weight up to 23 kilos. So it started out at 10 and then 23 with the food. So that's why we really need to concentrate on what we're gonna pack. So what kit to keep things light? Let's start with clothes. Now clothes, you only need, for your outdoor clothes, like your hiking clothes, you only need one set, one of everything. You don't need spares. So we have one, uh, base layer top, one pair of trousers, a mid layer, and then a really good set of Gore-Tex waterproofs. Okay, we don't need spares of those things. You might take two pairs of pants and you'd probably take two pairs of socks, but only one of the rest of it. Your socks, if you get your feet really wet, then get into your dry pair as soon as you can because wet socks are where blisters start to appear. Now, in addition to those clothes, you need what I call your tent clothes and they're really, really important. Um, again, you have a lightweight base layer and a lightweight trouser layer, and then you have a pair of tent socks. Never, never, never wear your tent socks 
uh, to replace your hiking socks even if they're wet. These must stay dry, as must all this kit. And I also take a lightweight down jacket. Uh, all of this lives in a dry bag. And this is your kind of survival kit. This is what will stop you getting hypothermic if you're soaked through to the skin, um, it's been an awful day and you're shaking and everything else, you get out of all your wet clothes, get this lot on, this dry lot on, get in your dry sleeping bag and it, will, it could make the difference between you being hypothermic or not hypothermic. So really important that stays dry in a dry bag. Okay, moving on from clothes, uh, sleeping bags. Um, you can have a down sleeping bag or a synthetic sleeping bag. Now, when we're talking lightweight adventures, we're really going down the down sleeping bag route. They are more expensive, um, but that's because they weigh a lot less and they can be compressed down to a much smaller pack size, which is what we need. Uh, the downside of a down bag is the fact that it can't get wet. Um, even if you're you know, really careful with it and you keep it in a dry bag, it can still get wet while you're in your tent from the compression, compression? Uh, condensation from your breath that is often caused on the roof of the tent and also on your bag. So if that happens, make sure during the day when you're outside um, around lunchtime or, or something like that, the warmest point of the day, you get your bag out and you dry it. Um, also dry your tent. Uh, but the bag is so important, put it above your head if there's wind, make a big wind sock with it and let it fill up with air and it will dry in no time. But when you're really tired and you've got a really long day ahead of you, the last thing you want to do is these things, but you really, really must make yourself because I can assure you a wet sleeping bag and a wet tent to get into at the end of a long hard day is enough to reduce you to tears. Um, as for what bag to buy, um, this is the Mount Equipment Firefly. It weighs like 550 grams. It's a brilliant lightweight bag. Um, I use this for bike pack racing. It's not warm enough for all my trips. Uh, I feel the cold. It might be warm enough for some, but it's a really, really good lightweight bag. Um, the best kind of all round bag that I use, what I use most often, is also a Mount Equipment bag, but it's called the Helium 400. Highly recommend it. Um, this isn't the bag it comes in, but this is how I take my sleeping bag. So this is the bag the sleeping bag came with. It's a stuff sack, it's great, but I always put them in a true waterproof stuff sack. And then, you know, you know your bag's gonna be protected to keep it dry. Uh, while we're talking of keeping the bag dry, um, in my backpack, oh, let's see if we get this going, we over. Uh, um, backpacks usually come with one of these waterproof covers. They're okay. I don't highly recommend them though. Maybe as an added extra, but they blow up in the wind and all sorts. So I always have a big waterproof liner bag inside my backpack. So it's basically a big dry bag. So that goes in and everything goes inside there. So something like the sleeping bag, which is also in a dry bag, is double protected. I know that sounds a bit much, but I can assure you, having a dry sleeping bag to get into when you're exhausted and tired, it's not too much. Double bag. So that's that. Uh, right, um, hydration. So we've got lots of cool things on the market. We have water bladders, we have water filters, we have things like this water well, which has a filter that you put in the bag and can drink straight from it. They're all great, I take all that kind of stuff with me, but my one bit of kit that I would never ever ever go on a trip without is a the humble Nalgene bottle. They are cheap, robust. Uh, this is 12 years old and it's come on every trip with me, so they're, they're good value. Um, great water bottle, but the reason why I will never go anywhere without one is because I use it as a hot water bottle. Again, back to that important thing, sleep. I don't sleep well if I'm cold. And even if I'm not on a trip which is to a cold destination, if you work really hard all day and you're exhausted, then you can just feel cold to the bones. Um, so what I do is I boil up a litre of water, usually before I've even made my dinner, pop this filled with the hot water in my sleeping bag, and then once I've done all my chores and I get in my sleeping bag, A, it's already warm and toasty, but then I can push it down to the bottom of my sleeping bag and keep my feet warm. 
So yeah, the Nalgene, great 10 pounds worth of spend. Okay, what next? Let's talk cookers. Uh, so many types of cookers on the market and they all kind of have their own job. You, there's not really one cooker to do everything. So to run through them very quickly and very briefly, because you could go into lots of detail. Um, firstly is something like this. This is an MSR reactor stove and it is what they call an integrated canister stove. And that means the actual cooker and the pot are all designed to work together. Um, they have one job that they do really well and that is boil water very quickly and very efficiently not using too much gas. Uh, the same with the jet boil, that's kind of an equivalent and uh, the MSR wind burner. So they are fantastic for doing one job and that is boiling water really really quickly. So if you just want a cup of tea or you're using like freeze dried meals on your, on your expedition then that's fantastic. Um, they also melt snow really quickly, but they don't, they're not designed to cook food in like real food. If you want to cook real food, then you want to use more of an open flamed um, cooker like this. This is called the Pocket Rocket 2. It's a fantastic little stove and folds away even smaller. Still obviously using the canisters and you will use more gas with this kind of uh, cooker, but you can change the speed at which you can cook, which means you can pop pans on there and um, cook bacon or make a porridge or make yeah pasta in the evening it just gives you a lot more flexibility and you can get like little pans like this one that pop on or a big pan to cook loads of porridge in titanium pans they're expensive but this is 15 years old and I, I imagine it will last my whole lifetime so they are worth it uh, that's that and then the third type of cooker that I use is um, a multi-fuel cooker this is an MSR wind burner I think um, and yet you just attach um, your fuel bottles like this so these are refillable whereas the canisters you have to be going past a shop to obviously get new canisters and these you can refill with anything they're designed for white gas really but um, yeah I've uh, across China I filled mine up from petrol stations or wherever I could find anything that would burn basically um, yeah and while I'm on it you can see from this bottle I've got uh, gaffer tape and electrical tape around it um, they're part of my repairs kit, but to save um, space, I always put them around a bottle, whether a water bottle or fuel bottle. It's just uh, something I spied there that might be interesting to know. Um, a spork. Buy a titanium one. Don't buy a plastic one. It will break and you'll be very disappointed. <laughs> um, okay, what else? Uh, oh, this. So repair kit. Um, lots of cool things in your repair kit. Uh, but it really depends on what kind of trip you're on. But one thing that I'll have on all trips in my repair kit is this. This is a very robust, strong curved needle. You can use straight ones, but I find the curved one is uh, more effective. And this is dental floss. And together they will sew up pretty much anything. Um, this would sew up a uh, rubber bike tire, or it would sew up your strap on your backpack if the whole thing came off. Yeah, you'd be amazed what those two very light, very small things can get you out of a pickle with. Um, okay, things not, to, oh no, actually first aid kit, let's do that. First aid kit will very greatly depend, go, depending on where you're going in the world and how remote that is and what kind of emergency services are on offer. But regardless of where you're going, the one thing I would recommend in everybody's first aid kit is zinc oxide tape, um, also called Strapal. It's amazing, it's super sticky, it stays on for days and days on end, even if you like go in the shower. Um, but it's great as a second skin, so even if you're feeling even the remote sore spot on your feet, get loads of it on there um, and it, yeah, before blisters come. It's, in my opinion it's way better than Compede or anything like that, so that would be my recommendation. And then another recommendation if you're going somewhere really remote where um, yeah, you might not get emergency services come to you very quickly and therefore you need to really be able to look after yourself is a quick clot dressing. Um, this is something that you would, if you've got a massive cut and you're bleeding out everywhere, you'd, you'd put this dressing in the cut and it will cause it to clot and basically can save your life with that and stop you bleeding out. So um, for a, it doesn't weigh much, it's worth being in your kit if you're heading to remote parts of the world.
Okay, here's a few things not to take. A towel, you don't need it. Um, it will get wet and smelly and won't dry very well. You don't need one. Rent one if you're going somewhere where you pass any form of accommodation. Um, deodorant, again, you don't need it. You have one set of clothes, you are going to stink, embrace the stink. You won't have enough for the whole trip, so don't bother carrying it. <laughs> Shampoo and conditioner, again, you don't need them. If by any chance you happen to be going through past some accommodation by chance and you might want to stay there, then borrow some, buy some, plead. Um, they will take pity on you, I'm sure, and loan you something, so don't worry about carrying this. Things you do need, though, is your toothbrush. I always so um, saw the end of mine off, you don't need a full length one. And some toothpaste, although I actually use toothpaste powder. It lasts a lot longer. Um, and then weighs less, so it, for yeah, weight ratio it's much better than toothpaste, but you could take a little toothpaste like this. And I always take sun cream and lip balm. Lip balm is not a luxury item, this is super important, your lips die on expedition, so SPF lip balm is a necessity. Um, poles. Walking poles are brilliant if you're doing a big through hike or something like that. I know in the UK they're not super, super common or popular, but um, I'd highly, highly recommend them. Particularly if you've got a heavy pack on, they really um, distribute the weight better, help your joints, um, better balance, uphill, downhill, just, yeah, just, just try some poles. Um, I'd also recommend cork handles if you see them, particularly uh, when your hands are sweaty, the cork handles are just much nicer, you don't slip on them. Um, sadly, I haven't got cork handles, but still, I love these poles. Um, I will show you a couple of things that I have as luxury items, just uh, so you know I'm kind to myself as well. Um, this is a pillow, a blow up pillow, it weighs about 25 grams, I only take it on trips longer than a week. Again, that's just because I think that you know on a big trip sleep is so important and it does make me sleep better, so if it's a week or more I think that's worth the extra weight. If it's less than a week I'll just stuff some clothes in the um, hood of my sleeping bag. Um, my other luxury item, if it's a colder trip, is down booties, 100 grams, but as I've already mentioned, if I have cold feet, I don't sleep very well, and sleep is key, so I think those 100 grams are really worth it for me, and this is the kind of thing that is way more worth taking than an extra top, you know, um, yeah, this is, this is going to make the difference between sleeping or not sleeping, and an extra top, you'll smell anyway, so don't worry about that. And then my final thing I nearly always take is this, it's a seat mat, it weighs nothing, it costs nothing, it was like two pounds or something like that. Um, gosh, I don't need it, I can get by without it, but I find it really useful. I sit on it to cook if the ground's wet, um, I stand on it to put my boots on, save my socks getting covered in rubbish. Uh, yeah, it's just a simple but useful little item. Uh, oof, I think I'm going to stop there, there is so much kit uh, that I could talk about but um, I've waffled on for ages so we'll stop there and then if you have any particular questions about the types of kit you need with types of trips or more information on what I've talked about or other stuff, yeah, just comment below and I'll get back to you.